Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And I've been reading uh, some introductions on chat. So I think we have a very diverse audience and I hope that people with different levels of background knowledge and expertise will find this talk uh, interesting. And um, regarding the questions, feel free to write them in chat and I, I, I'll make a break somewhere in the middle of the presentation so that we can do maybe the first Q&A session before uh, continuing and yeah, I'll cover a lot of work on intent detection, both from academic and uh, more like uh, industry production perspectives, where the focus won't be only on performance, but also on efficiency of these models and what gets implemented in the final dialogue systems and, and how all of this actually works and yeah i'm going to cover a lot of cutting edge research which is now used in uh, production models as well so i hope as i said that many of you will find all this interesting so we'll start from the very basics so so before i say anything i need like we need to first uh, position the work and i think much of work on today's dialogue systems actually uh, comes from the long tradition of what we call modular task-oriented dialogue systems. And yeah, the first disclaimer is that in this talk, I'm just gonna talk about task-oriented dialogue systems or task-oriented conversational AI, and I'm not gonna cover uh, open-ended chit-chat systems. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm gonna focus on uh, task-oriented systems where the idea behind these systems is to help the users to uh, solve or to aid them in well-defined tasks like this example that i have on this slide which is the example of uh, enabling the user to book a, a cab in, in london so uh, traditional modular task-oriented systems have these well-defined uh, modules or blocks and some of them uh, actually convert speech to, so so it starts with the uh, uh, user speech uh, which has to be transcribed to uh, to text. So we have the speech recognition or uh, ASR module that then uh, gets speech into text, and the text goes into the language understanding module, which needs to figure out the what the user actually wants with, with, with the input. And then, yeah, the dialogue management module needs to decide what to do with the previous user input. With the current user input also taking into account previous dialogue history, the role of dialogue management is also to interact with third party APIs, uh, etc. And then finally, we need to get back uh, to the user uh, taking the appropriate action, which is chosen by the dialogue manager, and then creating a, a, a text output from the system that can be converted into final speech using the, the text to speech. Uh, module or like speech synthesis here. So, so this is the whole pipeline of the system. And in this talk, we're going to focus on one aspect of language understanding, which is really, really important. With, uh, and this is intent detection. So, so, so this slide here already covers most of the things that I'm going to cover during this talk. And so, uh, as I just mentioned, yeah, uh, the user inputs uh, voice in their native language. It can be English, but we're going to talk also about uh, other languages later in the talk. So we need to figure out how to transcribe that speech into a text, regardless of the input language of the user. And um, as part of multilingual nat natural, natural language understanding, we have to figure out how to provide call it like a machine readable a semantic representation of the user input uh, and then do something with the dialogue manager or dialogue policy and then provide a spoken response. So, so this is where we talk about intent detection. So when the user says things, for example, in the banking domain, like I cannot log in my account. So the user can say uh, that uh, they can't log into their account in many different ways, only in English, but uh, speakers of Spanish or speakers of Croatian, which is my native language, will say that in their own native language. And there are like multiple paraphrases, but uh, uh, it all boils down to basically exactly the same intent, which is this login, lo login account intent. So, so you can actually see this intent as some sort of a latent class, which can have multiple semantic surface realizations, which are actually sentences related to that class. And those sentences can be paraphrases in one language, in English, or that can be uttered in many different languages. And uh, uh, the actual task of intent detection is to figure out which intent 
the user actually wants to convey in, in the current utterance and then do something with the intent inside the policy module. So, so you can already see that this multilingual NLU module is in a sense uh, uh, language dependent. So we need to figure out how to understand Spanish inputs and English inputs. Uh, and then we have these like universal classes, universal intents. So we don't care uh, if, if those classes are in what language and, and the policy is largely language independent. So we will we will define our um, systems action uh, irrespective of the actual input language. So, so yeah, if the user cannot log into their account, of course, we need to figure out uh, like uh, how to help the user. And yeah, it doesn't matter if the user speaks Spanish or English. And then finally, so, so that's the idea. So we're gonna cover all these aspects related to intent detection in this talk. So this is something that I already mentioned. So, so the basic idea behind the current cutting edge techniques for intent detection is to use this, what we call a canvas of semantics, or the idea is based on encoding uh, text into actual uh, data points in a hyperdimensional semantic space so that we can actually capture all these different paraphrases in, in one language or in multiple languages. And the idea is that sentences that utter exactly the same intent, like in this case, initial booking, should have very similar representations in that hyperdimensional semantic space. And uh, so basically to, to, uh, to learn a model, an encoder model that will learn to coherently cluster and encode sentences that belong to the same intent. So, so that's the main idea behind many of the things that I'm gonna mention in this work and behind deep neural models that, that uh, try to cater for, for this. So, okay, but there is an inherent problem with task-oriented dialogue systems. And this is basically that if we wanna have a system that is really good in many languages, in many domains, so the, uh, when, I, when I say domains, you can think about banking or hospitality industry or insurance or, uh, uh, yeah, so, so other sectors where, where voice assistance can be very helpful to humans uh, and skills are also different tasks that uh, these systems can do. They can book something for you, they, you can actually do some FAQ, et cetera, et cetera. But in order to really uh, make a dialogue system that works really well across all these combinations of languages, domains and skills, you, you need annotated data. So, so it won't really work well for uh, really specific tasks and domains without having annotated the data. But getting the data is very labor intensive. It's very time intensive. And yeah, machine learning models cannot work without data. So the idea that was uh, that we actually uh, were following in, in our own work is how to minimize this reliance on annotated data because you can't possibly see all the paraphrases of all possible tasks, domains, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, um, so this is like a rough development cycle uh, that we've been following in, in our work. And this is why we actually want to create data efficient NLU and intended detection for dialogue where, yeah, first you, you need to kind of create some minimum uh, amounts of training data for particular task and, uh, and language, uh, develop a baseline system, then uh, unleash that system, work with real users, see, see where it fails, do labeling, do relabeling, and, and then uh, re, uh, retrain your model, your machine learning model on the new data, on the improved data, and improve your system. And, and then continuously improve as you go. And yeah, so, so this is like the dream scenario, but we still need to kickstart the system with, uh, yeah, uh, not so much data because we, and we also need to anticipate what sort of, uh, errors uh, the system might produce if we don't have the data. So, so, so we have to create more and more data on the fly also to, yeah, to, to patch for, for mistakes, et cetera. So we also need very adaptive and adaptable solutions to the problem. And one of the core mechanisms to achieve this is to make use of pre-trained models, which are trained on large data collections. And much of today's uh, NLP with deep neural networks is really based on uh, these like large neural models. And uh, probably you're more familiar with uh, pre-trained language models like BERT and Roberta. And uh, what we actually figured in, in our research is that 
they are not really good for conversational tasks when they're used off the shelf. So, so what we wanted to do is to change uh, their learning, their objective functions to actually incorporate uh, the natural conversational uh, dialogue flow uh, into the learning process and actually get much better conversational text encoders, pre conversational pre-trained models that we can use for conversational tasks like intent detection as, as one of the critical tasks for, uh, for NLU. Uh, but another requirement for from production is to have very efficient protocols to uh, and learn uh, small, portable, and efficient models. Which means they have to be small in terms of uh, storage requirements. Uh, they have to be trained uh, very efficiently. They have to be quite small in the number of parameters. They have to be very well adaptable when when they see only a small number of uh, in-task data for a particular task and domain. So, so all of this is really important to actually have something that works and works well uh, for intent detection. So um, much of the work that I'm gonna show is based on the uh, current standard NLP's transfer learning state of mind and paradigm where the idea is to uh, learn this really large uh, pre-trained model only once and then fine tune it uh, many times for particular applications, tasks, language skills, as I said. And um, yeah, between pre-training and fine-tuning, you might also have some auxiliary steps or mid-steps where you try to adapt like a general purpose model first to like your domain in a more general way, and then kind of create this, what we call a specialization funnel, where you go from something really versatile like one model to rule them all type of thing, but which does not excel at particular tasks and, and domains. And then, you've, and then you can gradually specialize it to your final destination in a, in, in a sense. So, so we're gonna talk about that as well. But yeah, so in order to actually pre-train those models, um, yeah, we need these data sets, which we call conversational data sets, which have these natural conversational flows. So, so you can actually see Reddit as one big resource, which really has this structure where people say something and somebody responds and then the conversation continues, etc. Or uh, another two data sets that are also fit for this purpose are Open Subtitles and Amazon QA. And we uh, collated and cured all these data sets which are available online, but Reddit is probably the best source for pre-training because as you can see here, it's much larger and covers a lot of different topics uh, in its contents. And what we actually did is we went through uh, yeah, 3.7 billion comments from, from Reddit and created uh, more than 700 million uh, examples of what we call imp input response pairs. So um, given an input sentence, uh, we also have like the succeed, the following sentence of that input, which it called uh, the response, and this will be our training data. So, so the idea is actually uh, pretty simple. So instead of doing language modeling like all of these previous models, like Bert and Roberta, what we are doing is uh, response selection as a pre-training task. So, so the idea is if you have which this is more like QA based type of objective. So the idea is if you have this input uh, sentence like, is it authentic Japanese food? Uh, you need to rank the correct response coming from the actual data. So this is the positive example above several negative uh, examples. And um, yeah, the idea is to give a high score for the positive actual response from the data and low score uh, for all random responses. So how it is actually implemented is in each mini batch, you, you just have uh, one response which is correct. So if, and all the other responses from all the other items pairs from the same batch are treated as negative responses. And uh, th this way of uh, training, which is often termed now by encoder in the current literature, is also a very uh, efficient way to, to do this. And it's more efficient than doing what we call cross encoders, where you have to combine every input and every response in a, in a, in a separate, um, a, a, as the standalone input, and then you need to model the cross attentions between input and response. So here we kind of have, two streams, dual streams of, of text inputs. So yeah, uh, inputs go to, to their own stream and then you have uh, responses going through their own stream and they, they have shared parameters as I will show you 
here. So, so this is the actual uh, diving deeper into the structure of the of the model that we call convert, as you can see here. So yeah, so the idea is, as I said, to have these two streams of text, one for input, one for response, and they have these shared parameters here, uh, which are standard transformer uh, blocks with uh, feedforward networks, addition and normalization. And those two, uh, and then we encode inputs separately and encode responses separately in each of the power networks, and then we let them interact with the uh, um, through through that product, which actually is the objective, saying okay, uh, let's let's give high scores to positive responses and let's give uh, negative uh, low scores to negative responses. And the way this model is trained is um, just taking these input response pairs uh, from the entire Reddit uh, corpus. So. Um, here, we kind of see that we moved a bit from intended action, but this is an integral part that enables all the NLU that, that we actually do in, in uh, the neural net based uh, dialogue system. So we will get to uh, intended action uh, quite soon. So yeah, this is the more, as I said, uh, the, the main idea uh, from the conceptual level uh, is, is showed here and a more technical realization of this idea is in this diagram here. And this is not the only way to produce these uh, conversational uh, or sentence encoders uh, as, as I show in this slide. So, so the convert is, pre is a pre-training model, which basically means that we take the full ready data and then we start from a random initialization and and just yeah, run run training from from this random minute, uh, and that's it. But more recent work has shown that we can also transform pre-trained language models. So we already assume that we have pre-trained English Bert or Roberta or all these models, and we can transform them into sentence encoders using exactly the same principle of these like uh, two streams of information for. Uh, text information for input and response, but then fine tuning them on conversational data instead of full scale pre-training from scratch. And um, so, so uh, all these methods are basically uh, based on the principles of what we call contrastive learning, which uh, tries to contrast between positive responses and negative responses. And contrastive learning actually learns a much more discriminative, discriminatory um, semantic space which separates two positives from, from, from negatives in that space. And many other researchers came up with the same idea. So I'm just listing some of the examples uh, here. And so we're gonna talk more about this model later on in, in the talk. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that this is pretty much like an established principle now. And many of the uh, current NLP tasks have now started using some form of contrastive learning in one way or another. Okay, so back to convert. So what I actually showed before was what we call only a single context model variant, where we just model the interaction between only the immediate uh, input and the response. But uh, this means that we kind of do not take into account the the structure and the history of the previous conversation. And sometimes lacking context means that we can't really figure out the correct response. Uh, so here is one example of, of, of a short conversation where it is extremely difficult to figure out uh, the response of a teacher to a student's uh, input sentence without really observing the rest of the conversation, as you can see here. So uh, there is also a, a multi-context convert variant, which takes into account preceding context up to uh, 10 sentences back, uh, where we just concatenate these uh, contexts into, into like a longer string of contexts, and then model the interaction between the response with the immediate context uh, and the interaction of response with the uh, previous input and then further combine these two scores into the final score, which this is a very simple way of taking uh, a longer dialogue history to account for these types of models. And uh, I think there were more sophisticated approaches 
that emerged after we published the, the convert work. So uh, there might be some papers that you might be interested in. Um, okay, so one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, actually create our own pre-training model is because we also wanted to constrain its use of resources for pre-training and we wanted to own the whole training and fine-tuning pipeline. So most of the results that I'm gonna show are uh, with are actually achieved with what we call this resources constraint optimization, where we pick the best model after training only for 18 hours on 12 GPUs, which means that we can do fast engineering cycles and actually uh, track progress on our final tasks like intent detection pretty quickly. And pre-training is not so expensive as you can see here, and we can even run models on, on CPU. Uh, and the final model is, as you can see here, um, much smaller than some uh, well-known uh, pre-trained models like Burton on BERT. I think uh, BERT is 400 megabytes or something like that. Uh, so we kind of achieved every, uh, what we uh, strive here for. So like yeah, an efficient model that is trained uh, really quickly and which is which can be stored uh, in 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 uh, taking uh, less storage space and which is not really costly for pre-training so that yeah even uh, non-big companies can also uh, use uh, the perks of, of, of this training okay so so far i haven't even touched intent detection but this encoder model is pretty much the basis of many things that we're going to cover later on so yeah now 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 we're back to intent classification uh, yeah, so as I said, the paradigm is pre-train once and then fine-tune uh, for many tasks. And uh, so convert can support tasks like retrieval-based dialogue, also like another task, which is part of uh, dialogue NLU called value extraction. We're not going to talk about that. Costing will transfer, but all of this is like a separate topic for another talk. So in this talk, we're going to focus on intent detection. So here is just this small figure uh repeating what i said in, at the beginning so the idea is yeah what well, we have uh a, a sentence uttered by the user as input to the model and we have the encoder model which produces this encoded sentence point and the idea is to have sentences which describe uh, the same event uh, to obtain very similar encoded representations in our uh, hyperdimensional 768 dimensional uh, semantic space so that all card arrivals, uh, card arrival sentences actually have very similar representations so that we can successfully classify them later on. So, so yeah, that's the, that's the main idea. And this is again, like a, a more technical realization of, of this idea that I just mentioned before. So yeah, we first pre-train the encoder model, which is shown on the left side here. And then we, uh, fix the encoder model and, uh, do not tune it any anymore, and we just append uh, um, an, a, an MLP classifier on top of the fixed sentence encodings and just train the classifiers, which actually gives us a much more efficient solution than fine-tuning the entire model. So, so previous solutions to the problem uh, typically take uh, took, I don't know, large pre-trained models like BERT, Roberta, and then fine-tuned all the parameters of the model to intent detection. And, and this feature-based approach where we just have the, a fixed encoder that, that doesn't get fine-tuned and we just learn uh, parameters of the MLP classifier uh, brings us a lot of efficiency in, in, the, in the approach. And basically uh, this slide shows uh, an intent detector which is used in production at uh, poly at the moment, both for single label and multi-label intent detection. Uh, just to quickly uh, touch base on the differences between single label and multi label intent detection. In simple words, yeah, multi label just means that a, a, the same sentence can have more than one intent attached to it, uh, while single labels means, yeah, one sentence, one, one intent, which is a, a, a simpler approach uh, to intent detection. So, okay, so, so, so this pretty much. Uh, yeah, shows how can we use this large pre-trained encoder that has seen massive amounts of, of English data at pre-training for in-task intent detection across different domains. 
So I'm going to show some numbers now. Uh, so, uh, so one of the first things that we did is we tried to, to benchmark the solution to, to some of the existing solutions in academia and industry. And we did it on three standard uh, research data sets for intent detection. Uh, so the first data set, uh, so they have different properties. So the first data set is Banking 77, which covers a single domain banking, but it is very fine grained and it, and it has 77 different intents that can be seen in the banking domain. And the other two data sets uh, uh, have slightly different properties. They are multi-domain and uh, yeah, cover a large number of the int of intents, but some domains have small number of intents, some intents are, are, are final grain, and uh, evaluating on, on these different data sets gives a pretty uh, pretty broad and pretty nice perspective on uh, how different models behave. And an interesting thing to uh, mention is that we evaluated in, in multiple data setups, uh, so because if you remember from the beginning, the idea is to have really quick development cycles so that we start with minimum data requirements. So it's pretty interesting how, how good these models behave when we have only 10 examples or 30 examples per each intent versus full data setups. And yeah, so, so the numbers are summarized here. So, so basically, I've, I've just listed the main findings from all these numbers so that you don't have to look at all of them. So off the shelf BERT is a language model and it's not a good sentence encoder. So, so when we actually uh, fix BERT and then just use BERT as a, a means to produce the sentence encodings and do not fine tune it, it doesn't really work well. It, it kind of catches up in full data scenarios, but it's still much worse than the other models. So BERT tuned is the variant of the uh, BERT large model that actually gets all of its parameters fine tuned but it is a very expensive procedure. And it, so these numbers basically convey that the efficient feature-based intent detection with dual encoders, so uses another uh, dual encoder similar to Convert, also trained in, in the same uh, dual encoder fashion with uh, different stream, uh, streams for, for inputs and responses. So yeah, so they are much more efficient and they're, they're pretty much as effective as fine tuning the entire BERT, which means that, yeah, they're more production friendly in a sense. And we see especially strong results in, in, few, in few short scenarios. So this is very encouraging that even with uh, 10 examples per each intent, we can actually uh, recover a lot of performance uh, from, from full data tuning. It's, it's not perfect, of course, but it, 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 it's still, it's still pretty decent. So, so yeah, as I said, this is this is very encouraging. Um, but since since I mentioned efficiency uh, several times, it is also important to note that yeah, this solution which just stacks uh, MLP on top means that um, yeah, we don't have to uh, yeah fine tune the entire model, but it's it's also much quicker uh, to to use convert for encoding sentences that, for example, BERT large as, as an encoder, even if you turn it into a sentence encoder. So, so you can see some uh, encoding times on CPUs, and actually this is the number of sentences that, it, that get encoded per second on CPU and GPU. And you can see that uh, fine tuning the entire BERT model is, is much uh, slower than, than using the uh, fixed encodings from, from sentence encoders like use and convert, which is extremely useful for production. And we also, back in the day when we created this work, we also did some um, comparisons to that, to existing uh, commercial systems, and we were really happy with the results. So I'm just showing it uh, to, to kind of convey the message that even this very simple and efficient solution backed with uh, neural sentence encoders can can produce uh, really, really accurate intent detectors. And we are currently rerunning the analysis also uh, covering multi-label intent detection. So yeah, this is a disclaimer. This uh, empirical comparison was done uh, like a year ago. So maybe the, the actual numbers have changed in the meantime, but yeah, I just wanted to uh, yeah sh show the, the positive outcome of all this. And yeah, so maybe I can take 
some questions now before we delve into other topics like multilinguality and voice and yeah other other approaches to intent detection happy to answer them so uh Yvonne, thank you so far. We have seven questions in the Q&A and three questions in, no, two questions in the chat. One of the questions in the chat about Hungarian overlaps, one of the Q&A questions. Uh, do you wanna just uh, read them off uh, yourself or I can read them to you if you prefer? Okay, so I'll try to do it myself. Um, yes, yes. I'll Okay, so uh, a question from Christopher is use plus convert. Okay, uh, which are, are they sorted by? Never mind, I'll just go from top to bottom. Uh, yeah, use plus convert outperforms most of the baselines. So what is use adding that convert misses? Um, yeah, so we haven't really dealt so, um, yeah, so so deep into the analysis, it, it, I think it's just that uh, use was also trained on slightly different data. So uh, it's more like a standard ensembling thing uh, in machine learning models, where you basically by having more than one model, you kind of boost your um, I don't know um, certainty that certain uh, classifications are more correct, and, and some others might be might be wrong. So, so I think it, it, it mostly has this like ensemble voting effect. The problem is that basic uh, for production is that although the numbers are uh, slightly higher, uh, you still need to have and maintain two models in production and uh, everything is then like two times slower because you have much larger vectors. And yeah, so uh, I, I guess that's a trade-off between uh, doing ensembling and not doing it. So Seth Levine asks, uh, what if the training data does not have an appropriate response? Um, I mean, uh, every response is appropriate because we just, in, we just extract those input response pairs from the Reddit data. So if, if a response immediately follows the previous input, we kind of treat it as a, yeah, as, as a positive response. So this is a very noisy heuristic, but this is the best we can do. I, uh, I mean, we, we could maybe, uh, we, we actually even try to apply some uh, filtering heuristics to, to just go for like uh, higher matches of inputs and responses, but then figured out that just training on everything actually is, is, uh, is a more robust strategy. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's uh, another question is, uh, are there differences between how we handle conversations with two speakers versus more than two speakers? So in the current setup, when we train a, the convert model, um, we are not really doing it. We just have like one conversational thread and we just go over the thread and yeah, just take inputs and responses as we go. So, so we're not really taking into account any, any speaker in, uh, information. What about low resource languages where it's hard to build a pre-trained model? Uh, so this will be covered in the second part of the talk. You also had a question in chat specifically about Hungarian. So yeah. So, so have you tested if this model generalizes to tasks outside of response selection? Yes, indeed. So, so I mean, uh, I think this was also partly answered later in the talk because yeah, the encoder model it just its pre-training objective is response selection, and then naturally it gets really good in response selection, but. The idea is that through doing response selection, the model becomes really good in capturing, uh, encapsulating general conversation knowledge, which can then be exposed via fine tuning uh, in conversational tasks. So, so what I'm showing in this talk is its use in intent detection. And we also used similar pre-trained models, even convert in, in one work uh, for uh, spell labeling, value extraction for dialogue and, um, it can be used also for, for other non-conversational tasks. So for example, for name entity recognition and extraction, which is also pretty important for, for conversational um, systems as well, if you need to capture your client's names, et cetera. So, so it's a very versatile model that, just, that needs to be adapted to a specific purpose. Um, okay, another question is how many tasks can you fine tune on one generic pre-trained model? Um, I don't know. Uh, 
how to, I don't know if, 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 if the author of the question is here, if, if I, I need some clarification of the question. So, so basically pre-training objectives, uh, we can also combine response selection and mass language modeling. So we can combine more than uh, to more than one task for pre-training, if that's the question. And if the question is, uh, if we can apply the same generic pre-trained model to more than one task, the question is yes. So, so that is exactly the idea. We have a fixed model that we can just then use in many different tasks. And I've, I've voice enabled Christopher if you'd like to elaborate. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Evan. Um, yeah, just to clarify further, you, I think you've nearly touched on your answer there. It was just uh, obviously depending on the task, um, the further apart the tasks are, the, the less of the model is going to actually do, do a good job of uh, yeah. fine tuning against. So I was wondering if, um, like, was there a rough pattern? So let's say change of address, right? Like, you could find it exactly for that, but I assume. Um, well, my personal objective being with NatWest and, and, and commercial aspects is we want to try and find a balance of a cheap, efficient model like yours, but um, try and find you as many tasks as possible without otherwise you can have a, uh, even, even a convert, um, even though a uh, convert's much smaller than um, yeah. typical models, you're still going to have end up having 10 or 20 of them to cover all the tasks we're looking at. I hope that clarifies further. Yeah, so uh, that, 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 that's a really good question. So. So what we've been working on is then uh, also, uh, I'm not covering in the presentation, but we also have like new approaches that are able to adapt the model to different domains by just fine tuning a very small number of parameters or like adding extra parameters. Maybe you've heard about uh, adapters, for example, which yep. then store domain knowledge in just a small portion of parameters. And then you just apply this additional adaptation so that you have one big model and many small adapters for different domains. So that's what I thought you had. You'd have maybe 10, 20 adapters on one. Yes. Yeah. So big focus. yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ivan, uh, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, you can continue if, up to you, you can continue with questions or you can defer questions until after the second part of your talk. Okay, I'll do one more and then uh, this one is quick. Yeah, does dot product loss assume that the input and response will be closed in the semantic space? Yeah, that's exactly like dot product is yeah pretty much non-normalized close and similarity. So uh, yeah, so it exactly says, okay, with dot product, uh, just push input and response uh, close in, in, the, in the semantic space. So one thing that I failed to mention is that we also have some uh, input specific and response specific parameters. So, so that we also do like input-based transformation, response-based transformations, uh, which, which also can control how much they get close uh, in, the, in the semantic space. So, so the idea is more like inputs that have similar responses should be really similar in the, in the semantic space. So, okay. Um, uh, I think I will stop now because I still have quite some ground to cover. Uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. Very, yeah, it, very interesting, very insightful. Uh, okay, so where were I? Uh, so I showed like the basic skeleton model for monolingual English uh, intent detection, which start from text. But yeah, what about other languages and what about voice? So, so many, uh, Many academic papers actually assume that we that the world uh, works only with English and that we work with gold ASR transcripts. And of course, none of those two assumptions are true in the real world. So uh, what we then wanted to find out uh, in the company is what will happen if we start from voice inputs and uh, do some evaluations in the banking domain uh, with uh, multiple different languages, as I will, uh, I will show in, in, in a sec. Uh, so, so first, even before we do anything with text, multilinguality entails many different problems with speech recognition. So I, I won't get into details here. There are some uh, uh, multilingual pre-trained ASR models out there that can be fine-tuned to better capture particular languages. So all of this also has to be done. and. Uh, this entail, this implies doing some sort of uh, pre-processing like uh, 
neutralizing accents, normalizing accents, which is one problem. Biasing uh, means that um, if we work in a particular domain like banking, then we want to bias our ASR systems to give us transcriptions that are more related to the banking domain than to some other domain. So this has to be done. And a good thing with ASR is also to maybe combine uh, outputs from multiple different models uh, and do some also plenty of post-processing uh, uh, steps like uh, also learn using NBEST uh, uh, items from the NBEST list selection, do some phone matching, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of things to cover only when we talk about multilingual ASR and uh, this is pretty important. And, uh, but I'm not getting into details here because we don't have time for that. This is like another um, uh, lecture uh, again. So what we then researched is, yeah, as I said, how well does multilingual intent detection work across multiple languages? Still focusing mostly on more production important languages like uh, high research languages of the world, et cetera. And is multilingual ASR for those languages the major issue or not? And we, as part of the work, we also created a first multilingual voice-based evaluation set for intent detection, which is available online. So, so you can play with it, you can actually check if, if you can provide better solutions to the problem, et cetera. So the actual data set covers 14 pretty reasonably well-defined uh, intents in a banking domain, which I'm listing here. And we covered 14 language varieties, as I said, uh, mostly focusing on uh, like our production languages. So we, we, uh, we've been experimenting, experimenting with three variants of English and also covered yeah, like German and French and Italian, but also some more distant languages to English like Korean and Chinese and Russian. So, so th this is a very recent work. So uh, we hope to expand to lower resource languages in, in, in the follow-up work, et cetera, but we just wanted to see how it works with, with those languages. And uh, we set out to answer several questions. So first, uh, Okay, I talked about convert all this time, but uh, what happened in the meantime in other research threads is that people have created also multilingual sentence encoders. So uh, probably the best multilingual sentence encoder at the moment is Lepsi, which covers 100 plus languages and which was uh, created by transforming Embert into a sentence encoder also via the principles of dual encoder learning just with different data. So they have, they've been using uh, parallel data instead of um, uh, input response data, et, et cetera. So, so you can actually check that work. But the principle is, is exactly the same. So you can take a multilingual encoder as just a generalization of a monolingual encoder where you have sentences coming from different languages and they get uh, encoded into points in space where sentences with similar meanings should have similar representations regardless of what language they come from. So that's the idea. And then we wanted to see are multilingual encoders actually multilingual? In other words, whether uh, they actually uh, uh, equally well represent all the languages that they uh, cover in, in, in those sets of 100 plus languages. Can we also uh, do well if we just rely on empty models where we uh, transcribe, transcribe the speech data into, um, into the actual text data and then do machine translation to, uh, to the English uh, language. And then effectively all we do from the dialogue NLU side is then yeah, effectively monolingual and we can use uh, English tools. And we also wanted to see if uh, using ASR and best lists uh, makes an impact or not, like if we take more than one hypothesis from the NBEST list. And if we can use multiple translations of the same input, this could be seen as maybe a sort of data augmentation. So we wanted to see if this also improves the robustness of the system. So yeah, this is a big uh, uh, table of results. Uh, you don't have to understand uh, much of it. It's just it, it, again, I listed three most important uh, messages here. And this is that LabC works better than a multilingual use as a sentence encoder. And that translate to English actually works pretty decent for, for our experimental setup, especially with LabC as the encoder. So yeah, one thing that I forgot to mention is that the actual intent detection works exactly the same way as before. So, so we just have uh, sentences that come into a multilingual encoder which is fixed, we don't fine tune it, and we just learn uh, um, an MLP classifier 
on top of these fixed encodings, and, and that's it. So uh, another thing that we can see here is also that, um, yeah, uh, as I said, performance is pretty strong for all these languages. Um, and yeah, which, which gives us hope that we, we can actually uh, extend this uh, research also to lower resource languages, but this is also like an ongoing work in progress. And another thing to see from this uh, table is that without Intas data, so, so what we try to do is also import data from a related project, which doesn't, we didn't have exactly the same intent, but it was in the same domain, et cetera. It had some very similar sentences, but yeah, without Intas data, you can't really do well. So uh, so we, we, we need Intas data to really reach this high performance. And maybe similar data is good for kickstarting the project. But it's so this is the auxiliary data that you can see here. Here, uh, yeah. So more details are in the paper that we published. So I just wanted to give you one perspective to building multilingual uh, intended texts here, and then yeah, side results using multiple ASR hypotheses. Uh, yeah. So using more than one transcription doesn't really bring strong benefits, and I think this is mostly because all of these transcriptions are pretty similar to each other. So we don't actually get high lexical diversity. And when we use multiple translation systems, so what we try to do here is combine uh, outputs of Google Translate versus outputs of DeepL, which is another commercial translation systems, and they sometimes produce different outputs, which means that yeah, really like different translations can act as sort of data augmentation and make the model more robust also to potential translation errors. So we did observe slight improvements uh, with more than one translation system. So that was an interesting uh, take here. And yeah, so this idea of having a multilingual encoder, of having a principled way to deal with all these different languages also enables us to yeah support uh, multiple different languages in, in, in the same system with the same uh, dialogue flow uh, and all that. And uh, it even enables us to switch languages in real time. So, so with a language identification model that we could have in the system, we can then just decide, okay, let's uh, switch on, for example, like a, a Bulgarian uh, part of the NLU and, and do intent detection for Bulgarian. And then the user switches to uh, back to English, we're going to then again switch on the English part of NLU because everything is pretty much, uh, it, 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 it's a very versatile framework designed this way, uh, which is also something that all these multilingual systems should, uh, should uh, strive to. Okay, so finally, we're now going back to um, a, like square one, uh, I, I dare to say. So uh, now I'm going to talk more about improving performance of of intended tactics again with more sophisticated approaches. So, so we, we saw that MLP on top of fixed encodings works really well, but then we've been thinking also, can we frame single label intent detection as a sentence similarity talk? Because if you remember from, from, the, from before, uh, all these sentences uh, can be seen as surface language realizations of different latent intent classes. So, so basically, uh, if we treat intent detection as a sentence similarity, we can just find the closest sentence to our input sentence and then just propagate its label to, uh, to the actual input sentence if, if they classify as we hope them to classify. And this is slightly different than doing the learning of the MLP decision boundary, as you can see here. And yeah, this non-parametric classification has some desirable properties as I will uh, show later. Okay, so uh, so we set out to, dis to to work on two critical questions. So the first question was, is it really necessary to conduct full-scale uh, expensive conversational pre-training as some, something we did with Convert before? And I think I partly answered that question already at the beginning of the talk. And yeah, the answer is no. We can even take pre-trained off-the-shelf language models and then just fine-tune them on much smaller amounts of input response data. So we can just take a small subset of Reddit and already convert those language models into really good text encoders. So, but the more interesting question is question number two uh, about framing intent detection as a sentence similarity task. Okay, so, so what we are doing is exactly this fun fit 
conversational fine tuner uh, procedure, which is a two-stage procedure, uh, and it's covered. Uh, it, it's covered in a diagram that you can see here. So we start from an input language model, and then we can do fine tuning to to get it into transform it into a conversational sentence encoder by doing fine tuning on ready data exactly in the same way as we did with convert, just using much smaller amounts of uh, fine tuning data. So you can already see that doing this also means that uh, it might actually work uh, better for if we want to create similar uh, encoders for other languages like Hungarian, because we will need a less data or like less Hungarian data, or we will need less data translated from English to Hungarian to do this uh, Hungarian fine tuning in stage one, if we reduce data requirements of, of ready data. And then after we have already uh, transform a language model into a conversational encoder, we can do a standard MLP classification, which is pretty much the setup that I've been talking all, all along until now, or we can continue and further specialize the encoder to become a really, really uh, good encoder for our particular domain or our particular task using in-task in TED data. And then we, if we create really coherent clusters, related to these intents, we can do similarity-based classification uh, really, really well. So, so both stages are realized as these contrastive learning procedures with yeah, two separate input streams that I talked about quite a lot during this talk. And um, I think this TSNI diagram actually uh, shows exactly what's going on during the fine-tuning procedure. So if you just take a language model of the shelf, you can see that there are some well-defined clusters, but it's not really good. If you do uh, stage one with general purpose uh, dual encoder uh, fine-tuning, you can already see that yeah, uh, these clusters become more and more coherent. And finally, after we do in-task tuning for particular uh, tasks and, and with, with the actual in-task intent data, then we get really, really coherent clusters, which means that, yeah, we can really do similarity-based. Uh, inference. And the idea is to combine this general knowledge already stored in the pre-trained language models plus this uh, intent class knowledge of our target task to really specialize, to have this specialization funnel, as we call it, from a general purpose model to a, a highly specialized sentence encoder. And we use the power of contrastive learning while doing it. So, um, so how it is actually implemented in a more technical way is that we don't really use explicit intent classes anymore in modeling. We just learn based on sets of positive and negative examples for contrastive learning where we say, okay, if we have some annotated uh, intent data for the particular task or domain, uh, we just say sentences X and Y in the training data are from the same class uh, and we should pull them closer together. These are our positive examples. And negative examples are just two sentences that actually have different intent labels and we should push them further apart. So, and the principle of doing that is exactly the same as what we did with convert. So you can take any of the standard uh, contrastive learning uh, loss functions. You have plenty of repositories online to do that. So you can actually do binary classification and just say, yeah, try to distinguish between positive and negative examples. So you can, you can do cosine-based uh, track repel, which basically means you set a hyperparameter of positive cosine similarity and another of negative cosine similarity, and then you do mean squared error loss, where you're trying to bring um, positive pairs closer to this ideal of positive cosine similarity, and the same thing you do for, uh, for negative pairs. Or you can do other uh, contrastive learning functions like on online contrastive learning and all these other standard functions that are listed here. So yeah, there's a lot of different uh, objectives in, in the standard playground uh, play of, of contrastive learning. So this is a big uh, table of results, mostly to show you that we ran a lot of analysis in, in our work So uh, and compared to many different models. So the setup is, is the same as before. So we have the same three data sets, the same three setups, and uh, I'm not gonna bug you with all these numbers. So, so what I just wanted to show uh, is, is basically here that, uh, yeah, uh, we, can, we can indeed uh, transform Roberta as a language model into a pretty decent text encoder using uh, much smaller amounts of ready data, and it's already on par with convert. 
which is a pre-training model on the banking data set. And if we do in-task contrastive learning and similarity-based inference, then we get much uh, many gains in performance. And this is like a pretty, pretty big uh, breakthrough in performance. This is in 10 shot scenarios, but it works equally well in 30 shot and, and full data scenarios. And then we again did a lot of side experiments where we also, yeah, one thing that's obvious is, of course, if you use more Reddit data, you're going to get uh, better encoders after stage one, and then you get slightly better encoders after stage two as well. And um, given that there's also like a large body of work on uh, creating universal sentence encoders, we can even bypass stage one and just take any of the shelf sentence encoder that is out there and, and then just fine tune it for it with in-task tuning in stage two and more results analysis in the, in the paper. And there are other researchers who actually uh, came to similar ideas. Uh, so, but, and this is all very, very fresh. It's like, uh, it, was, it, it was published maybe, I don't know, like a month ago. So this is really like cutting edge research on intent detection in, in monolingual setups. And one thing that I wanted to really uh, emphasize here is that this similarity-based intent detection has one pretty interesting desirable property where you can actually improve your performance without retraining the model. Uh, so me which means that you can insert more and more data for your intents and your performance will go up without the requirement to, to retrain the whole thing. Of course, if you retrain it with more data points, the performance will go even higher up. So we demonstrated that in, uh, in one side experiment where we actually took uh, a 10 shot setup where we have only 10 sentences per each intent for training. We trained the model and then we used 30 shot or full data uh, setups, but only for inference. So we just had more data points at inference and you can see that, yeah, having more data points at inference will really boost your performance. And yeah, so, so you can go even more extreme and train with only like two or three examples per intent. And the same pattern is still visible, it's just that the absolute scores will be slightly, slightly lower. And yeah, so why do we even need or want this similarity-based inference? So yeah, there are many benefits to it. For example, you could have dynamic classes, so it, you can train the model with one set of uh, intents and then just, uh, I don't know, switch off uh, certain classes during inference, if you, uh, or you can merge certain classes. And it also offers not explainability so much, but more like interpretability, where you can basically see why uh, a certain input sentence fails if it's too close to some outlier. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then maybe you want to manually fix that, uh, etc. We also realized that doing contrastive learning is very stable to different hyperparameter tuning setups. So yeah, uh, and, and it also made uh, classification models more stable. So you can also combine classification and contrastive learning in a joint learning framework. And if you do that, it's gonna become more stable. So that's something. And it reduces data requirements because uh, yeah, it, it, we got highest gains in few shot scenarios. And given that everything is based on similarities, we can even encode intent labels if they're meaningful semantically or intent descriptions. And which means that by reducing data requirements, we actually have much quicker development annotation cycles for, for new domains. And there's plenty to do. So, so this is very, very new. So we can further improve fine tuning and efficiency by taking other loss functions, uh, working with better pre-trained models or doing efficient fine tuning like the one that I mentioned with adapters. And this goes beyond intent detection. So we can apply similar principles maybe to other classification tasks or try to do something similar for slot labeling for dialogue NLU. And another interesting property is because everything is based on sentence similarity, we can also try different data augmentation strategies to create paraphrases. Uh, so we start from a set of five sentences for a particular intent and we can maybe leverage GPT-3 or some of these language models, generative models to create more uh, paraphrases for us that we can insert. And yeah, and we would like to port this to multilingual setups. It's all work in progress at the moment in our small research team. Yeah, so how to do efficient and multilingual NLU, it's more like a sort of a conclusion is, yeah, the first thing is understand what is language independent, what is language independent. So, so most of multilinguality kicks in uh, at the NLU 
uh, module and uh, we also need uh, pretty strong ASR tools in order to achieve this. And uh, the use of a pre-trained model also helps us to, to be very robust in, when it comes to different slangs, noisy, informal data, which also reflects yeah, these uh, uh, conversations of people in the wild. And uh, by separating language dependent and language independent parts, yeah, uh, we can keep majority of the flow even when we deal with other languages. And yeah, I mentioned at the beginning, we can insert more data, uh, more in-class data over time. The model gets improved with real conversations. So, so this is also one important aspect. And as the very final uh, part of this talk, I listed some very high level conclusion suggestions, which means that, yeah, we have to, retraining and adaptation seems to be the key in current uh, NLU with deep neural networks, where we need to leverage both a high amounts of general purpose knowledge, but also a much smaller, much more expensive amounts of in touch data. And efficiency is crucial for production, where it's it's typically it's okay to trade some performance point for speed if this is needed. And reducing data requirements as, uh, on the annotation side means that we can kickstart the system much more quickly and get more quickly into production It generate more data to improve the system. So this is very important. And uh, when designing NLU, it's also important to understand your task and domain because some domains might have fine grained intents, some will have coarse grained intents, some uh, tasks will inherently need single label intent, uh, intent detection, some other tasks will need multi-label intent detection. So there is not one universal solution to, to every single domain and task. So uh, an important thing is to understand your domain and task, understand your ontology, understand what your, you want your system to achieve before you start choosing the right model. And also, yeah, there are profound differences between voice-based versus text-based NLU. And yeah, ASR might not be a problem for some languages. It might be a bigger problem for some other languages, for some other domains. So try to have an adaptable ASR uh, use biasing, and this is all very important. And one thing that's on the horizon is really building these dialogue systems for truly low resource languages. And as I've shown, multilingual models are not equally good for all languages. And yeah, we are just talking about 100 languages. So what happens with all the other 6,000 plus languages that are still currently left behind and in order to really, yeah, for the models to work well, tiny amounts of FinTAS data or small amounts are uh, quite crucial. So few shot scenarios are much more beneficial than trying to do something without any in-task data or without any in-language data. So, so I'm, so yeah, we still need some data, um, but the, the hope is that we can kickstart our models with smaller uh, amounts of data. And this is what we are actively working on. So yeah, that's pretty much, that's the end of the talk. I, I hope it wasn't too much information. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer some more questions now. Yeah, I love technical detail. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, so you have more questions in the q and I see nine open questions there. One of them's for your contact info. And I, I'm gonna just invite again, I'd say we could take 10 or 15 minutes uh, if anyone wants to be enabled to ask your question live, use the raise hand. And if you've already answered, uh, posed a question in the Q&A, then we'll just uh, cancel it there. But you want to go ahead and take a first question from Q&A, Yvonne. Okay. So yeah, uh, so the first question is, when data drifts over time, what are your views on retraining, fine tuning? Uh, Yeah, so so th this is a good one. So um, it is it is it is not very easy to decide um, uh, when exactly to kind of take the checkpoint and say, okay, now we're gonna um, yeah, now gonna re re retrain the system. It's it's typically, I mean, uh, when we monitor the system and when we re we're trying to do like some automatic or semi-automatic error analysis, and then we if we figure out that certain intents are not well captured, uh, then we we need to insert more data or re-annotate the data and retrain the model. So, uh, but but there is no 
uh, a single answer to, to this question, uh, I'm afraid. It's, it's also very like kind of sector specific or project specific. Also, it depends on how granular the intents are, et cetera. Okay. So I've got some new questions now. Um, yeah, my contact info, I forgot to mention it. Uh, yeah, so it's Ivan at polyai.com. So I, I, I'll just type it here. Yeah, so uh, one question is on the best ratio of the number of negative and positive samples. So uh, I don't know if this, uh, is it about confit or convert? Because the, there are different answers to it. So in convert, we use uh, a multiple negatives ranking loss where the larger the batch, the better it is because yeah, it, it just means that you have more negative uh, samples in, in, in the batch. So I think we used a batch size of 512 while for a confit where we use these like uh, losses like online contrastive loss we have the analysis in the paper and basically i think uh performance flattens already when we have uh two three or four or five negative samples so you just gain like really slight boost in performance but it's much more expensive because for each positive you have more than one negative so so i would say that yeah, it brings something, but it, it saturates quite quickly with, for example, online contrastive loss that we use for comfort. Um, so uh, we actually, uh, have you, or are you planning to make your conversational encoder publicly available? Um, so we had that encoder publicly available, but then had to remove it due to like, I don't want to get into details. So uh, I still think that Convert is one of the best, if not the best conversational encoder on the market. But if you want to experiment with similar ideas, there are plenty of uh, sentence encoders besides Convert where you can start developing your models. So uh, I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. So I can't really dig into why it's not publicly available anymore, unfortunately, but yeah. How well uh, works the intent detection when the input isn't informational but contains humor, irony, sarcasm? Well, uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not perfect, of course, and it, it probably it won't be captured because we don't have any dedicated sarcasm humor modules. And basically, when we do task-oriented dialogue systems, we kind of still hope and that the users will just want to. Uh, I don't know get a, get help with the task they're trying to do. So if they're gonna try to book a restaurant. Um, yeah, so they won't really use sarcasm so much. Uh, one important thing to mention is that, so uh, we still have uh, a pretty important handoff intent in, in, in our ontology of intents, which is also when the model in, the, in a task oriented, uh, or when a system cannot help the user, we need to detect that the user also wants to speak to a human. And we also have modules that kind of uh, monitor the potential dialogue breakdown where it's not possible uh, to really resolve the, the users uh, query anymore. So we're just going to suggest a handoff to them as well. So, so this is how we handle because I think all of these humor, irony, sarcasm uh, things are pretty uh, difficult cases where we still need humans. But so. Uh, the ambition of having uh, all these automatic systems is to really cover uh, a, a huge ground of, uh, of uh, like more of, of simpler uh, inputs and gradually expanding to more and more complex ones. So, so yeah, handoff is still very important uh, for the systems when, when the system detects that it can't really uh, understand what the user is trying to say. Uh, a beginner question, what is shot when you refer to 10 shot or 30 shot? So it, yeah, that's like NLP terminology, um, which means in this context uh, that I discussed, 10 shot means uh, 10 example sentences for each intent. So if we have 77 intents for the banking data set, it means that we will have exactly 77 
times 10 sentences in our training sets. And 30 shot, yeah, it's 30 very intense. Uh, is there a better way than depending on mini batches to create negative samples for training the dual encoder? Uh, there is, but uh, the problem is that it's more expensive. So, so this multiple negatives ranking loss, we use it exactly because it's probably the, the quickest loss that gets you to a good solution. What, and we didn't even try to mine hard negative samples. And uh, I think this would improve performance, but doing it on the fly or is very expensive for the procedure. So we just decided that it's not worth the effort. So, so yeah, there are, there are better ways. Uh, so for example, instead of using, yeah, uh, only random negative samples, try to create hard negative samples or batches with harder samples. So for example, you can think of batches that contain related, related sentences that have different responses. For example, that uh, and there is some work on, on on that as well. So, okay, so this one is answered on where do we access the paper? Uh, have you compared your most recent few shot learning intent detection to task descriptions approaches such as uh, uh, PET, which is pattern exploiting training, which is based on the prompting and tuning. Uh, tuning from based solutions. So, so yeah, we haven't because it, uh, this is all very new work. So, so this is also on the menu. Uh, now we need to adapt. Uh, yeah, we need to, we need to adapt from based learning also to, to cover intent detection. Uh, so we, our research team is working on that right now. So, so yeah, this is like a completely new set of baselines uh, for us. Uh, and I think I have one more left. Have you considered using speech to text uh, to use YouTube as a new source of training data? Uh, so in this talk, I haven't really covered, uh, yeah, so I haven't really covered speech to text. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a huge expert in speech to text, to be honest, so, so I'll, I don't have a good answer to that, but yeah, so I, I, I think speech recognizes, I don't know if maybe they use YouTube data. I, ha I have to check uh, if, if somebody actually pre-trains on YouTube data, uh, but of course, yeah, uh, that might be a good source of information, uh, but I don't know if, uh, if we have any privacy and I don't know, uh, GDPR restrictions on using that. So. Yeah, there are all kinds of uh, questions. We, I, I, we're out of questions now. We're also, I'd say, out of time. We've been going for quite a while. Uh, it's a mark of a good talk that it prompts a lot of questions and discussion. So I think people have voted with their questions here. Thanks very much for the presentation, Yvonne. Uh, as I put in the chat, if others are interested in giving a meetup talk in the future, that includes future meetup talks in person in Washington, DC or New York, send me an email message, grimes at altaplanet.com. And we are supposed to have a next online program on December the 20th. That's just two weeks from now. So I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, it should be posted soon, as soon as I get information from the speaker. So uh, thanks again for joining us today. And if you do have any questions or concerns about the meetup, also send me a note. Uh, you can message me through the meetup platform as well. Uh, so until next time, bye.